Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our insightful conversation, Empowering Change, Advancing Equity Through Sport. I'm Daisha McClam, and I'm thrilled to be your moderator for today's discussion. As we gather here today during Black History Month, we embark on a journey to highlight historical and contemporary barriers that have hindered participation in sports for Black individuals and to explore practical strategies for fostering social change through sports. Before we delve into our discussion, let me introduce you to our esteemed panelists who bring a wealth of experience, insight, and understanding to the table. First, we have Brandon Miller. Brandon is a former professional soccer player, prime focus goalkeeping owner, and United Black Players of USL Executive Committee member. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Also joining us is Dr. Nancy Dome. Dr. Dome is a renowned speaker, author, and equity consultant. She is also the co-founder and executive officer of Epoch Education, Inc. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Dome. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Also joining us for today's discussion is Kinshasa Garrett, who is the Regional Director and Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Sensitivity, and Enrichment Coordinator of the United States All-Star Federation. Welcome, Kinshasa. Thank you. Hello. It's so good to be here. I'm excited. So am I. <laughs> With us as well is Lance Lee. Lance is the Director of Community Impact for Team SNAP, focusing on increasing access to sport in underserved communities. Welcome to the discussion, Lance. Thank you, Daisha. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure's all mine. <laughs> Finally, joining us is Sean Granberry, a former Positive Coaching Alliance National Coach of the Year, Oakland Sports Equity Coalition founding member, and CEO of Hip Hop TV. Thank you for joining us, Sean. Great to be here with such an esteemed panel. I'm excited. Thank you all. A key focus for today's discussion will be on engaging and empowering youth, emphasizing the importance of positive youth sports experiences for their development and for their well being. Through a combination of historical insights and contemporary examples, we will examine the significant role of activism in sports, drawing lessons from the past to inspire and guide current and future efforts toward achieving greater equity in sports and society. This webinar seeks to provide participants with a deeper understanding of the challenges and opportunities in using sports as a tool for social change and to empower them with actionable steps to make a meaningful impact in their communities. With our distinguished panelists, we have a wealth of experience to guide this discussion. So let's kick off our conversation. Brandon, as a former professional soccer player and co-founder of the United Black Players of the USL, how do you see the role of athletes in advocating for social justice and equity in sports? And what challenges have you faced in this endeavor? I think the, the biggest thing I've noticed, uh, you know, in the past four years since I really ramped up uh, what I've been doing, it, it's like athletes automatically have a, a position of power and in society we elevate uh, athletes, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, you know, we elevate athletes, um, you know, as, as role models, as people in the community that we want to look up to. And so as athletes, we have to accept that naturally we're in that position and, and it puts a responsibility on these athletes to start to think about how they impact communities, how they impact uh, the thoughts and, and the, the decisions that a lot of these people are making um, because athletes can be thought leaders in their communities. And I think that that's something that a role that I, you know, realized back in the 2020, 2021 um, that I wanted to take on, but also that was already, you know, kind of thrust upon me in, in the role uh, that I was playing as a professional athlete. And I think some of the challenges that I've experienced over the over the few years is just keeping people involved, um, even, you know, keeping people engaged, even if they were, you know, gung ho about it from the beginning. Uh, I think it's tough to over the over the years kind of realize that, like, not everything is going to be immediate change. We may want to see more representation in, in youth sports and professional sports, uh, but it just doesn't happen overnight. And that's one thing that myself, I had to learn very quickly, uh, you know, starting my organization, United Black Players, I thought that 
a lot of the changes that we were demanding were going to you know, happen in, in three, four months. And it's been three, four years, and we're still pushing for some of the same things, and we're still having some of the same conversations. And so the biggest challenge is, is keeping people engaged, keeping people excited uh, and, and wanting to continue the work. And, and, and another thing is like understanding that, you know, athletes are thrust into this position. They're not always the most informed. They're not always the most um, educated on subjects. And so I think that's what kind of hinders uh, athletes from utilizing their platforms because they don't feel like they should speak up or have a role in it. And you, you see it sometimes you saw it with, uh, you know, when NBA players were, were speaking out or when NFL players were speaking out, you know, it's, it's shut up and dribble. It's, it's simply, you know, keep things on the field. We just want to see entertainment. And, you know, that's an aspect of it that we have to combat a little bit is like the sports are a, uh, a form of entertainment, but they're also a vehicle for change. And I think that they can be utilized for both. Absolutely. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for the work that you're doing and choosing to step up because as you said, it's not always um, respected. It's not always welcomed. So pushing past that is definitely an effort of will and motivation, inner motivation. Um, with that being said, you, you mentioned the platform that the athletes have to step on in order to make that change and to elevate their voice to speak out against some inequities. Um, this is open to the full panel. Can you think of an example of a time when sports served as a powerful platform um, for social chains and what lessons we can learn from that experience, either um, any specific athletes or specific movements? I would just chime in there, like from my first experience with it, um, just seeing it and how impactful it could be. Uh, a former colleague of mine, Kaya McCullough, she played soccer at UCLA and then she played professionally in the NWSL for, I believe, a year. Um, and she was one of the first college athletes to kneel. She's always, you know, voiced her opinion on things and, and tried to push for change. And her experience in the NWSL wasn't a great experience. And, uh, you know, she was one of the catalysts for change in the in the National Women's Soccer League for those who who uh, who aren't familiar, but it's a professional top professional league for women's soccer in the United States. And there were a lot of issues within that league, how how female athletes were treated, um, how women of color were treated. And Kai was one of the first people to speak up about a lot of the, those issues and really demand change. And if you look at what's happened over the past two to three years in that league, a lot of that was spurred on by what Kaya did and, you know, the other athletes that joined in with her. Cause I think that's the big thing is like, it takes one person to step up and say something. And, and cause then there's a, a lot of other people who may not have been comfortable in being the leader, but will gladly follow along and, and join in on, in that process. So I think that was, when I realized first realized like it just takes the one and it takes that one person who has the courage to, to speak out and then from there we can start to get a movement going and Shasta I saw you came off a of mute <laughs> <laughs> I did so one of the the first things that I think about and for those who are not aware the USASF is the governing authority for all-star or club cheerleading and dance and we along with the international um all-star federation host the world championships in Orlando, Florida every April. And it is truly a world championship. With that being said, um, early on in my career as a regional director, I would have a lot of contact with programs that had received world's bids that needed consultation, or I was on the panel that selected them to receive a bid. Well, there was one team in particular who had received their bid in California. And I was a huge fan of theirs. And then I saw them at Worlds. The owner came to me and said, hey, we've changed our routine. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. What the, the routine that you get, you bank on that. That's it. That's how we got it. That's how we're going to compete it. And what they had said was, we just want you to come in if you have a second to watch this piece. Well, it was um, a piece that was dedicated to Black Lives Matter and to Black culture. The, the team itself was incredibly diverse. You had Black, white, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, Asian, and it was a powerful piece. They knew that that was a risky platform everyone is there to win right everybody's there to get a globe but for them the message was here's the platform here's what we're seeing in the world how can we you know express our feelings and what we think the world should look like and they chose to to go that route like i said it was risky but it also paid off 
for them because they ended up being bronze medalists and that had been um, the highest level that they had achieved at the world championship. So that was huge. It was huge for us as an industry and, and huge for the world in general. And that's major kudos to the, the coach who made that decision to make that risky decision. It really gave those youth an opportunity to feel empowered to yes. make a statement um, at a young age. And hopefully they'll, they'll grow up to be um, like Kai when they come out of college because they had an experience like that at an early stage. Um, right. I really appreciate that. And it, it really ties in. And thank you so much for uh, for jumping off of mute because my next question is for you, Jessa. Great, great. <laughs> With um, your background in dance, cheer, and your role in diversity, equity, inclusion, and sensitivity at the United States All-Star Federation, how do you approach fostering an inclusive environment in such a competitive sport setting? And what impact do you believe this has on the young athletes? So I'm going to go a little bit backwards. I'm going to answer the second question first. So I feel that it impacts the athletes in a powerful way, not only with the lessons that they already learn through All Star with team, you know, and um, with the team bonding piece for them to feel empowered to learn more, right, when it comes to their skill but also to learn more about the world around them and to see outside of their respective bubbles. Because All Star is famous for the fact that we are diverse. We are highly diverse, gender, age, religious affiliation, anything you can possibly imagine, we have a place for everyone. But that means that individuals who are outside of their bubble may not have those opportunities to meet those individuals now have that. So I think that creates culture that will then spread out to the world to, you know, for lack of a better phrase, make the world a better place and to become more active and engaged in a lot of cases with social justice with some of the athletes that I continue to work with. Um, as an organization who is attempting to foster inclusivity within our sport, I, I feel that we create a transparent culture through the ability for our members at different levels. So for example, with our, our owners and our coaches, there's the opportunity to participate in conversations via committee work at every level of committee because that's how decisions are made for us as a membership organization. The USASF just doesn't make decisions willy-nilly. There's a lot of committee work involved and we need to hear from everyone. There are focus groups that everyone is able to be a part of and as a part of curriculum development at all levels as well, including you know, DEIS, but also safety and mental health with our athletes, which is my passion, and that's what I love doing, the absolute most, most is working with the athletes. It's an opportunity for them to participate in our leadership training, our bolt training. So we're able to have some conversations with athletes separate of the, the arena of competition, right? We want those authentic leaders to emerge. And we talk specifically about the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and sensitivity. There are focus groups that are geared towards all athletes. And then should they choose to up it a level, they can also apply to be members of our Athlete Advisory Council, which I'm proud to say this year is the most diverse and inclusive group that we have ever had, and it was the most competitive. So I'm proud of that. Um, finally, with our event producers and our affiliates, it's constant communication and partnership and conversations, sharing information that we may hear from their customers as well, and also working with them them to make sure that even their marketing and their on-site imagery is inclusive. That is, is such an intensive process that you're going through, and I really appreciate and commend how multi-level your approach is and how you're really thinking at each point, how are they engaged, how are people engaged in our sport, and how do we make sure that we affect change and make sure that it's inclusive? Uh, it's yes, very much appreciated. And the advisory council is like, the the pinnacle of leadership potential. So I I, I really see where you're going with this and, and the track you're running. Um, I'll I'll pose this question to you and then it's open to the full panel as well. 
Um, mm -hmm. What role do you believe that mentorship and representation play in empowering um, our young Black athletes? And how can we actually enhance these aspects um, in the sports world as a whole? So I think that for at least for the USASF and for myself specifically, I think that one, it's important for these athletes to see people who look like them in positions to even mentor, right, and, and to lead. And working with them, working with all of our athletes is important because we're able to help create the culture that we wish for every sport and for every environment, sport or, or not, or activity or whatever it may be. Um, I think that with our athletes in particular, they're, they're machines, right? They do what is told of them, when they are told to do it, and there's so much pressure on that score at an event. But oftentimes we can lose focus on the holistic side of things and having athletes um, with, have an opportunity to share their thoughts, their challenges, their concerns, their feelings, what they would like to accomplish with individuals who are leaders within our industry, especially if they look like them, is huge. It's huge. Thank you. Sean, I saw you jump off of mute. Yes, yes, yes. So um, thank you. And this is kind of what we specialize here in Oakland, California. I handle the community outreach for Jason Kidd, the retired NBA player, coach of the Dallas Mavericks, as well as Antonio Davis, another retired NBA player. And we uh, go above and beyond in terms of going back to the communities and making sure we bring those mentors because athletes are far more than the ones we see uh, as professional athletes, but doctors, lawyers, engineers, uh, a public works department, Many of these people are former athletes and former uh, high performing athletes that went on to do many things in their lives. Uh, so it's very important for them to come back to the communities and and talk to young athletes and just young people in general about their lives. So that is something we've been doing for years, not only bringing the, the professional athletes uh, back, but also uh, all the folks that were uh, athletes when they were younger and went on to do great things in life their stories are important too. So young people in urban environments, especially can see there's all kinds of opportunities in life. Um, even if it starts with sports, it ends up being all kinds of great things. So that mentorship piece is very important. That's vital. And I, I, I think the bringing in different members of the community is, is awesome. I like to tell coaches, every single one of your athletes is going professional in something. Um, so showing them some other paths that that sports will lead them to is really an open door so that they can they can dream a little bit wider and, and see uh, see themselves in different positions. Dr. Dome, was I mistaken or did I see you come off of mute a little earlier? No, you did. Um, and it, but, you know, Sean did such a great job. I, I think that whole idea of being able to see what's possible. You know, I, I played volleyball and volleyball in the seventies was not a sport played by many black athletes. And it was literally like watching Flo Hyman and watching some of these other greats that gave me the inspiration to know that I could pursue that, that I didn't have to be, you know, a skinny white girl to do this sport. And, and that really plays with you because you're looking around and nobody looks like you doing it. So, you know, my work has been to show our kids of color, particularly um, that, that nothing's off limits to you, right? And so we have to be there to show them that's possible. And so we, as we start to see more diversity in sports and we start to think about like, what's my responsibility as a former pro athlete to make sure that our young athletes coming up know that this is accessible to them too, right? And and so I, I take that very like personally and very seriously that that's kind of, I, I feel like it's our responsibility. I agree completely. You can stay off of mute. Um, <laughs> Dr. Dome, your education equity consulting work has been extensive. How do you see the intersection of sports and education in advancing equity? And what strategies can educators or coaches employ to support this? Yeah, you know, I think the first thing is I actually don't separate sport and education. I think that that sport is another form of education, right? Even the fact that we call it extracurricular, that it's outside, but 
when we when we are doing a sport, not only are we learning that skill, we're also learning those soft skills, those things that are going to carry us through life that are transferable. We're learning resiliency. We're learning um, how to how to win, how to lose. We're learning confidence. We're we're learning how to work hard, and those are going. I think those are the great equalizers because you know it doesn't matter where you come from. If you can learn those skills, they will carry you through life. I, I'm 100% confident that the reason I felt that I could open my own business and be an entrepreneur was because of my my you know lifetime through sport of knowing that I, you know I'm very confident that I can accomplish this, that I can work hard, and I know how to work hard, right? And and I think that when we think about the access issues that exist in sport, we have to figure out a way to kind of level that playing field for our kids of color so that they can participate, you know, as things go more club and, you know, I'm not knocking clubs, but, you know, club, when I played, it was really a good thing that club didn't exist because I would not have been able to afford to be able to play in club, which means I would not have gotten a scholarship to get my education, right? And so we have to realize that, that sport is a form of education and we need to not only be focused on those top performers, we need to be focused on all of our athletes that are participating and making sure that, you know, whether they're starters or not, that they are getting those other soft skills that are going to be transferable and useful for them, right? So some of the things that when I think about uh, tools that they can use is, you know, the first thing is just that I believe coaches, coaches really need to be culturally competent. They need to understand that uh, that their kids are bringing stuff to the table that they may not be able to see. Um, we, we all have carry our baggage, and we ca we have to address the whole child. We can't just address the skill. So this level of being knowing who your players are, knowing what they're showing up with, um, that's that's necessary uh, for success and and success beyond just the scoreboard, right? Um, and then also, I think, understanding that there truly is an access issue. And so what are we doing to ensure that um, all of our, you know, all of our kids are able to not just show up, but to thrive when they're there, right? And so whatever that climate and culture looks like on that team, are we making sure that our kids not only just got into the room, but can stay, right, on the team? Um, so those are probably my two biggest kind of go-tos is, just really knowing who our kids are and how do we support them to be successful, not just to get there. I think that's absolutely, that's poignant and very true and it rings true in all of our communities. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone on this call, um, you engage with sports at a different, from a different perspective and a different way. Um, but from each of your lens, what would you say is the most pressing barrier to equity in sports today? And then how can we collectively address those barriers? Well, I'll jump in real quick. I think one of the most pressing barriers um, is money. I think that it is uh, the fact that uh, because we've gone to this club model that if you don't, I mean, if you don't have the resources, your kid can't participate. When I was in school in the 80s, early 80s, um, coaches went to every high school to watch athletes play to give, you know, to think about scholarships. Now they don't go to high school school uh, games at all, unless there's just some like real superstar there. Um, they go to Las Vegas, they go to these other places where all the clubs are meeting. But what, what if you can't get there? And so all of a sudden, uh, sports that have the potential of being this great equalizer uh, for, for our kids, now they're not able to access that anymore. Shasta, you came off of mute as well very quickly. So I know you have something <laughs> on I, I'm right in line with Dr. Dome. I think that, you know, for, for us, the financial piece can be a huge deterrent. Uh, it is, it's very expensive, especially when you think about, you know, the pieces that are included in this. And if you want to be, you know, we've got tiered athletes. So we have novice, we have prep, we have elite. If you're an elite athlete or you wish to be an elite athlete, that's also not only the uniforms and, and the fees and all of that, but you're taking private lessons, right? Because you want to be on that world's team. So that in and of itself creates an, an extra barrier. And then if you look at, you know, the topic today with equity and sport, and especially within the black community, hair, right? Our, our young ladies 
are having to pay a lot more money to make sure that they are looking whatever that part is for that team. Now, I will say, you know, over the past several years, there's been a shift in, you know, um, in a, a celebrating natural hair and not having to go to those links, but it still, it still exists. But I think, yeah, overall, I would say that it, it the barrier is absolutely financial. I think to, to go off of that, I agree financial is, is huge, but I think there's also another piece to it because, you know, in specifically in the soccer realm, youth soccer is really expensive. Um, and what a lot of youth clubs, I've had those conversations with a lot of youth clubs and they say, you know, we provide scholarships for, for athletes as well. And the scholarship piece is great. And I think it's awesome, but just throwing money at the problem doesn't always answer all of the issues for these athletes. Right. So specifically here in Charlotte, we don't have a great public transit system. Uh, and so East Charlotte and South Charlotte are during traffic time can be a really difficult, um, route to go on. And so like one of some of the issues in the conversations that I've been having with you clubs is like, how do you provide equitable transportation opportunities for these kids? Because some of these kids who live in East Charlotte, they live in North Charlotte, they may be in a single uh, parent household and their, their um, parent works at, at 5 PM when practice is at 5 30, you know, and they don't have a way to get to practice. So just saying, Hey, we'll pay for your fees. If you can get here is great, but a lot of these kids can't get there. And so that's one of the issues that we're trying to address here is how do we start to provide uh, resources beyond just the money piece? Because, you know, when we talk about equity, it's more than just that financial piece, but I do like find financial is probably the number one barrier that I see. Can I just add to what Brandon, Brandon uh, and Kachata said is that what we're finding here in Oakland um, is that finding volunteers, like in Oakland, we have the park space, you know, we have the children, but the lack of staffing uh, to address it. So we're really challenging volunteers because there's some basic some basic um, things that we know just from 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 the stats and just from research is that one problem we have is little black girls don't run and jump and play organized sports at the level of other ethnic groups. So one solution is just getting little black girls to play soccer in kindergarten, like in the suburbs, is is because of the benefits of playing organized sports, you know, less likely to drink, less likely to use drugs, less likely um, to get pregnant in high school, uh, more likely to graduate high school. It's all these benefits just to having little black girls play sports, you know. So one of the things we're looking for is trying to figure out how do we get uh, volunteers because uh, – Women that have played organized sports going to do phenomenal things. A lot of research that shows women that play organized sports going to do phenomenal things in their lives. So the key we're trying to figure out is how do we market and entice volunteers to come back that can lower some of that cost factor, you know, just, just giving back and also sharing the knowledge and information about the benefits of young people playing organized sports, the outcomes that come. So kind of connecting the volunteers to the knowledge about the outcomes. I'm, I'm hearing a lot. There's there's okay. the the le one level, there's the, the actual finances to participate in the sport, to participate in elite level is daunting. And then to even get to the practices and the competitions, and we're not even talking about getting the families there so you have a sense of belonging in that space, but it, it, we'll, we'll leave that to the side and deal with that another day. <laughs> um, but there's all those levels. And then Sean, you bring in another level of looking at organizational capacity and does do the organizations that are in our communities have the ability to provide sport at a high level? To, can, they, can they actually have the capacity to provide a positive youth sport experience to all the youth that are in their community? We, we, we're having barrier after barrier after barrier. Um, so that, that is something that we need to start thinking about. And really, as, as you mentioned, Kinshasa, empowering our youth at high levels to think creatively. Because I put myself in, in with the old folks and I say that like, we're not as creative as that new generation. Like they might be able to think of some solutions that we can't think of. So really empowering them and equipping them with the understanding of the world that they're existing and how they can how they can affect change um, would be phenomenal. And we're not even we're gonna we're gonna leave the mental models, Sean, to the side of like <laughs> how how sport is viewed. Um, we'll, we'll we'll touch that in a second because that's a mountain of conversation there. Um, but clearly, when once we even get past at the family level, there's a lot that the organizations have to push through 
to provide the sport at the level that our youth deserve. Um, and, and Lance, as the director of community impact at Team SNAP, I know you focus on increasing access to sports and specifically in underserved communities through technology um, and using that as a vehicle for change. Can you share some of the successful initiatives or strategies that have significantly impacted communities in our nation? Sure, uh, thank you for that, Daisha. Um, technology should really be a bridge to bring communities together, but oftentimes in underserved communities, particularly communities of color, it's often a barrier. Um, you have some folks that are scared of technology. You have some programs that say, this is the way that we always do it. We don't want that new system. Um, you've got programs that are still taking attendance with a, a pen and a paper or using group chat. Um, and all this is really taking time away from where we want our program leaders to be focusing their energy, which is on the kids. I give a quick analogy. I went to an HBCU. I, I went to Hampton University. Love it to death. I'm a huge proponent of HBCUs. But anyone who knows when it's time to register for a class, you go to a registrar, you're going to be waiting in line for hours. And so the expectation is lowered. And often in underserved communities for, for, for youth serving organization, the expectation of services you're going to get is lowered. And what we want to do is we, we really want to raise the bar and level the playing field. And one way we can do that is by giving what we call technology grants. We give our technology away to organizations who would not normally be able to afford it. And again, what that allows these organizations to do is to offer higher quality services so that they can focus more on the kids. They can spend less time on dealing with stacks of paper and uh, phone trees and old school methods of you know doing attendance and scheduling and rostering, et cetera, uh, so that they can offer the highest quality product services to the kids. And again, from a perception standpoint, um, whether it be an HBCU or youth serving organization in, in any inner city, it's often, you know, getting the bare minimum services, not high level coaches, um, you know, executive directors doing the job of 10 different people. Um, so it's it's tough for the kid to get that high level of services. Um, so our technology grant program, um, giving our technology so that organizations can focus at a, or excuse me, function at a higher level to focus more on the kids is one way we're trying to level that playing field. And I really appreciate the the opportunity that you're presenting openly to so many organizations and communities. And the hope is that they'll take advantage and be able to work together in order to build more successful opportunities for the youth in their in their neighborhoods. Um, open for the for the full panel. Um, are there some other ways that sports organizations and communities can work together to create a more inclusive or to create several more inclusive and accessible opportunities for Black youth in sports? Uh, I would say the biggest thing that I've that I've witnessed over the past few years is just like listening, um, understanding what the community needs, as opposed to thinking that like I'm a sports organization uh, and I know what what everyone needs. Like I think listening and, and understanding how the you can best utilize your resources to help uh, or get involved in other communities. I think that's one of the biggest things. And I also think just like being in the communities as opposed to having the communities come to you. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest pieces that I started to to figure out more so when I was when I was playing and and something that I, I try to focus on now is like it we've talked about the transportation piece. It's a lot easier for us as professional athletes, us as a professional organization to take our resources to these neighborhoods, whether it's building a mini pitch or putting on a free clinic in, in certain areas, it's much easier to do that than to try and get you know, logistically try and get uh, people from different communities to come to one place. So I think that uh, those are the two biggest things for me for sports organizations. So one of the initiatives that we have within the USASF is All Star Gives Back. And so it is, you know, a program to promote giving back to the community because the communities are so supportive of our programs um, and we highlight them because you know everybody wants a gold star or they want a sticker or some sort of accolade so there is that piece to it but we also notice that many of the programs that participate in service don't make it known it's very much, you know, a secret or it's something that they don't want necessarily highlighted, which I think, which I think is great, but that's a double edged sword as well. Right. Um, the other thing I, I think that 
the USASF provides it, and I'm not sure how other organizations work, is that we offer many resources that we have developed internally for our members free of charge that provide them lists of different opportunities for them to get involved with the community, working with schools, you know, after school programs, working, you know, with, with especially with the Give, All Star Gives Back project, homeless shelters, um, children with special needs. There's all kinds of opportunities there, but I think that Brandon is right. We have to go to them, you know, and as I'm sure we've always heard, you gotta meet people where they are. And I, and I, and we can't be afraid of that at all. So, and I think that people will be receptive. People want help, even if they don't realize it and they're appreciate, appreciative of that when they do receive it. I just want to add to what Kinshasa and Brandon said in terms of, I did some research with the late great uh, sociologist, Dr. Fry at UC Berkeley. And one of the things he uh, 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 pointed out was when you're in a survival state of mind as a parent, you're worried about food on the table, you're worried about shelter, you're worried about the gas in your car to get your kids. You don't always think about what's the best program to put my kid in because you're, you're, you're thinking about other things. You're not even getting there. So we have to figure out a way how to get to those kids that need it too, because uh, we found it here in Oakland. Uh, uh, a lot of those parents are in survival mode, so they're not researching. I got this free clinic to go to. Uh, this they're not thinking about these. Things. They're thinking of basic survival. So when we put it out there, the parents that are doing the research aren't the parents that are in survival mode. They're finding it. So we got to go get those kids. So we need to figure out how do we go get those kids that really need to, to participate, even though their parents may not be thinking about this stuff. So that's and that's a tricky thing to uh, to solve. So I just want to kind of point out how to get to the kids that need it, that parents may not be thinking about how important this is for their kids. Well, and show, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm -mm. Go ahead. Can, can um, one thing that I just remembered, our executive director's son plays football at Syracuse and they have a new coach, a new head coach. And she had talked to us a little bit about their first meeting, right? This is going to be a huge culture shift for them. And one of the things that he said that resonated with her, especially regarding this topic, is that he specifically spoke to the community and the support that these athletes feel entitled to by the community, but they don't do things for the community. They're not seen in the community outside of football season. So he assigned these athletes to a block. So there are, there's a, a family of athletes. So maybe it's five O-line that are responsible for just about everything to do with that particular block. And it's making sure that it's clean, making sure that they are seen, making sure that they're getting to know the community. I cannot wait to hear how that has impacted the city of Buffalo. I cannot wait, but I thought that was a fantastic approach to, to service. Lance, I, I know you you also had a had an addition. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll be super quick. I know you want to get to the next question. No, um, I think everyone is right in terms of you know, Doctor Dome played volleyball, played tennis, was an expensive for, sport. Brandon played soccer, is super expensive. Sean was talking about uh, volunteers, and I think uh, transportation is an issue. At the end of the day, when you're talking about underserved kids and underserved communities it all trickles back down to dollars. Uh, you know, volunteers, can you pay for coaches or can you pay coaches a, a reasonable wage? Um, the transportation. And so I, I think that it's incumbent upon more city officials and government and corporations to start giving back more. And I think as a unified voice in the youth sports-based community, there needs to be a way that we can come together to make our voices amplified because I don't know how it is in every other urban city, and I'm, I'm sure it's the same. When you look at the kids and you look at the gun epidemic and the kids dropping out and all the negative things going on, I forget which panelist said it, but kids who are engaged in sports are far less likely to be involved in all of that. So sports is uplifting and making every urban community better. 
So why shouldn't a corporation who's making millions upon millions of dollars or even the professional teams that are making millions and millions of dollars not be investing in youth sports in these cities? You look at other countries, Europe, I don't have my stats in front of me, but I know a lot of times sports are free for those kids. Nobody, no, nobody plays for sports. So as the best, biggest nation in the country, why can't we find a way to be supporting our black and brown kids so that they can get on a track of excellence and not just sporting excellence, but excellence in life. As you said, Daisha, they're going pro in something. I'm not saying invest in, you know, just trying to make super high level athletes, but oftentimes why not try to aim for that? And if they don't become a pro athlete, maybe they get in college. If they don't get in college, maybe they graduate high school. So I feel like oftentimes it's like, let's just expose our kids to sport. But in the suburbs, it's let's make our kids great. In the suburbs, it's my kids go into law school or med school. But in, in the urban communities, it's maybe they'll graduate high school. Again, raising the bar. So in short, I just feel like there needs to be some more pressure put on local government officials, professional corporations, and even sports team to reinvest into the youth sports network in our cities. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. I, I'm sorry. I'm just going to jump in because you, you said it twice, and I've been writing notes as you were talking you said it about lowering the bar um, in the communities of color, you know, that we have lower expectations. And I think all of that ties back to what you're talking about. Even Sean, you were talking about um, needing volunteers. And I go back to, I think about what coaches are played, paid here to be in club sports is, is better than a high school coach is paid to coach club. Right. And so we, 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 we need those volunteers and there's got to be this level of expectation of of how do we attract attract excellence be, and be able to support that right and and that's where you're going lance is this idea that it's got to be a larger investment into the community it's the same thing why do our communities of color and urban areas not have grocery stores why don't they have the resources they need just to survive it's because we have not invested they are under invested areas and so if we really want to see the the impact of youth sport and see where it, because we know that it can change the trajectory of their experiences, we have to figure out how to make it a sustainable investment. Something that people not, I don't, I'm not donating a million dollars for three years. I'm talking about a million dollars every year for the next 50 years, you know, whatever that's going to take to get it where it needs to be. So um, I, sorry, I jumped in and, but it was, I, I was writing all these notes and I just needed to, to give a shout out, Lance. I think that's it. it it's higher level and we've got to hold our, um, our cities and legislation uh, uh, or legislature accountable to take care of our communities, help us take care of our communities. I completely agree, uh, Dr. Dolan. If Lance had talked a little bit longer, I might have passed around a collection plate. But um, <laughs> he he had a, a number of good points, and I think all, everything that you guys are saying is is poignant and really on on point with what we know of our community. Um, Kinshasa, that that experiment that's happening at uh, Syracuse of um, this is a community that supported the sport. These are your boosters. These are the ones who who, who rah rah for you on Saturday mornings. Um, how are you pouring back in? It ties directly to um, what, what Lance is talking about with the, this is the community that goes to work. Sean, you mentioned these are, these are people who are going to work in order just to get the food on the table. They don't have a chance to evaluate. They don't have a chance to invest and to volunteer, but if the company is being is receiving their their work, maybe they should be investing back into their children. So, like, how is this a community that is cyclically like supporting each other? How is it that our our government is supporting our our effort? I think there's there's some really great points coming in here on how sport can be a platform and a vehicle and almost like a, a beacon um, pushing towards equity in our communities. So, um, on on that very high note, Sean. <laughs> Um, as a community activist, coach, founder of Hip Hop TV, how do you leverage your platform in the entertainment industry to advocate for equity in sports? And what unique challenges do you face in this endeavor? Uh, well, um, we leverage celebrity a lot. So uh, what we specialize in is producing camps and community engagements that are kind of turnkey solutions for celebrities, like we do the Jason Kidd camp or the Gary Payton or the Antonio Davis or the Thompson Twins uh, camps. We try to leverage because we we know young people 
are are into a a a a age of social media where views, likes, and all that is very important to them. So, like uh, Dr. Dom said, we have to meet them where they are. So one way we do is we uh, but also with hip hop, a lot of the current hip hop stars were former athletes or current athletes too. So there's a lot of correlation between sports and music. Um, so we include, uh, like in our free camps and stuff, a lot of the music uh, uh, ladies um, and men play sports or currently play sports. So you can use all of that, all that traction to make young people interested in even one to come out. Because one of the challenges we face is that, um, and this is crazy to me, like in high school, Playing sports is not a popular thing really anymore. You know, it used to be the jock. It is, you know, we found at least in Oakland, a lot of the kids look don't look up to the athletes. Ah, I'm not going out there playing that mess, you know. So it's crazy for my frame of mind to think that sports aren't even the cool thing in many cases uh, uh, anymore. So it takes an extra hook to bring in the attraction because all that we know the benefits that you know that come come from playing sports. But um, you look at the parks, you know, you drive on Saturday mornings. Those parks used to be full when I, when I was a kid. Now it's, you know, it's older people at the park, you know, playing play basketball and stuff. So I think we have new challenges we have to look at of how do we even make sports attractive, uh, especially to our urban youth where, where the attraction level isn't there. I'm just, it's a means about baseball, you know, about, you know, urban youth participating in baseball. And overwhelmingly, a lot of black kids don't even play baseball anymore. And that was like a like a go-to sport when I was a kid. Like, even if you didn't like it, all kids played baseball, you know. Now, you know, it's hard to have leagues even, you know, exist in urban environments in baseball. So I think we got a lot of challenges to do. We got to figure out how do we use the technology and everything is available to even get young people interested uh, in sports, at least in, the, at least in our urban environments. I, I really appreciate that. And you really like, you turned my whole question on its head. Right. Okay. The, the intersection of entertainment right. and sports is not a challenge. It's right. it's the opportunity. It's our, it's yes. our hook. It's crazy. I say this, uh, I say this often that uh, sports used to be the hook yeah. to get us to do other things. And now we have to find a hook to get kids to play sports. It's insane. Yeah. The whole right. world is upside down. Right. But um, <laughs> I definitely think that there is, there's opportunity there. The people on this call have all like each of you are doing some phenomenal things. I think I've already said that word too many times. So I'm going to find another word next time around. But I think what you guys are doing each are really moving the needle, really changing lives and being influential. And it's what we need more of, what our, our kids need to see more of so they can feel empowered to really advance equity, to take the torch when you guys decide to stop running this race so hard that someone else is behind you to keep it going, um, looking to the future. What actionable steps can we take to ensure that sports becomes more equitable and more inclusive of a space for everyone? And this is for anyone on the panel to answer. I forgot to say one thing. If I could just jump in with it. But well, then you have to answer the question. After okay, that. I got to ask the question. <laughs> yeah, so, one of the, the answer to the question is the task force uh, that uh, Positive Coaching Alliance (PCA) has formed in the Oakland area and other areas is so important. It's so important because many organizations don't even talk to each other. They work in silos. And I want to give a prime example in Oakland. In Oakland, Oakland Parks and Rec and the Oakland Public Schools did not talk because two people 30 years ago didn't like each other. So for, for decades, they went through not working together because just two people, they identified who the people were <laughs> that didn't like each other. So who was who lost? The children lost. Our kids lost. Because two large organizations weren't talking, so the, the schools really didn't use the park uh, facilities, and the parks really didn't use the school facilities. Well, that's half the city. The, between the schools' properties and the parks' properties, that's half the city. So uh, uh, the task was very important. They brought everyone together, and then they talked about it, and they figured out, you know, why aren't we working together? So that was one solution that benefited our kids. But these task force are very important because it, it takes people working together. And that goes back to even the funding, you know, the mayor's office, the, our local elected officials are there to understand the importance of funding these type of things because they understand what the outcomes could be and how they become solutions. So 
I'm going to say the, the answer to the question is the task force in every city possible is what we need to do. I don't know how fiscal, you know, we get that done in a fiscal matter, but we need them everywhere. It's okay because uh, okay. Dr. Dome just mentioned that someone's going to pay us a million dollars for the next 50 years. Okay. So we're going to get task force in every single city. Um, and we're going to follow uh, Lance's plan. So we're going to bring everyone together in one room and then we're going to do a unified ask. Not each organization making requests, but we'll really get in a room. Um, part of what Positive Coaching Alliance does with our community impact team is really pulling together for roundtable discussions and talking about these topics of barriers and how do we how do we really achieve equity and what is the what is the steps we need to take in order to close those that gap and fight those barriers and then we get a really strong ask and that's how we get that fifty dollar million dollar um <laughs> fifty year million dollar commitment Dr Dome is those conversations uh, but are there some other strategies or initiatives that you think will really um, continue to create change over the next few years. Yeah, so, you know, as I said, with our organization, we we love committee work. We love it. And for us, one of our taglines, especially when we're working in with committee initiatives, is the answers in the group. You know, you have to first make the decision, right, to move forward. You have to move forward with without fear, which can be challenging in these times, but to surround yourself with people who can help you. Because as, as we will often say, we're not the experts by any means. That's when we partner with a PCA or a RISE or a Dr. Dome, a Brandon, a Sean or a Lance to take a look at what our needs are and then move forward from that. So I think, you know, the first actionable step, I think, like I said, is easy. It's just to decide. Thank you so much. So we have a few um, questions in our, um, in the chat and um, they're, they're a little bit long. So work with me guys. <laughs> um, as youth sport organizations seek to elevate the quality of coaching, there's a growing recognition of importance of attracting professionals who possess a blend of practical experience and academic knowledge. How can these organizations expand their reach to engage seasoned coaches who bring a wealth of on-the-field ex expertise while also valuing ongoing education and professional development? I know there's already a conversation of, or there's already mention of difficulty with volunteers, but as we mentioned, our youth really deserve quality coaches, they deserve well-trained coaches, um, they deserve all the best. What efforts can we do in order to really um, encourage those individuals to join in this work? Well, I'll, I'll say as somebody who ran a youth development organization with a few thousand kids, finding that type of coach that this, I don't know if the man or woman uh, mentioned is uh, it's like finding a diamond in the rough. You can find a coach who's really good skill-wise, but he can't return emails. You can find a coach who does emails really well, but he doesn't know how to talk to parents. So to, to find that well-rounded, uh, culturally competent coach who's good athletically and can uh, do some administrative uh, tasks, uh, it's difficult to find. And it's really difficult when you're paying him close or her close to minimum wage. So I, I hate to be beating this this drum, but if you want to attract that type of person, you want to have to pay them. Um, you know, you can talk about networking and posting on LinkedIn and tapping into alumni and tapping into local colleges. Um, those are all different strategies that you can use. But if you're not um, paying somebody a sustainable wage, and I think oftentimes we ask uh, young people to do this super important work where they're, you know, working six, seven days a week. They have no nine to five because they're on the clock all the time. And then we're asking them to take, you know, a, a very small a, amount of money that they can barely sustain, you know, a, a, li a living wage. So I think in order to a, a attract and find that that high level person, you have to find a be a, you have to be able to find a way to afford that person and, and pay them a decent wage. Lance, I want to push back a little bit. I want to push back a little bit on what you said because our initiative is to bring from the same neighborhoods those brothers and sisters that did the right, that went the, that made the right turns. The key is, or one of the facts is, many of those that can afford to not live in those neighborhoods anymore don't live there anymore because they can afford not to. So our our big thing has been pushing 
We need those people to come back and give an hour a week, two hours a week, coaching the team. They don't have to be the greatest coach. But we found that when we do that, and we have done in the past, those young people ask, how do you how do you afford that nice car? You know, you know, how do you boy, there's some nice tennis shoes you got on? You know, how do you how you afford that? This is a real example. And the coach said, Well, I'm I'm an engineer, you know, I'm designing the 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 tower at the San Francisco airport. I'm the head engineer on the new tower. Now, he was from that neighborhood across the street from the park. That's so where you're saying up. tap into people who don't exactly need the money, but they can they come don't need the money. Like, yeah, like, so me yeah. as a CEO, you can't pay me enough to come out. Yeah. And coach, I do it because I know it's the right thing to do. We right. got to tap into, and they're there. The the National NBA Association, the 100 Black Men, the, the list goes on and on and on, these organizations. We got to tap into those, but it's harder to get them to take an hour out their time. That's a harder sell to mm-hmm. say, I need you to come coach a team. You don't have to be the greatest coach, but you just being there and the kids seeing that you're from there. You know, and then you can tell just slightly tell your story. You know, my cousin Ray Ray, he went that way. I went to UC Berkeley, you know, so I I went to school (laughs) and I haven't looked back since. The kids need to see that because they're smart enough to make their own decisions, you know. And I I agree 100 percent. And I think that's super additive. But for that coach who's there every day, because that person is not going to be there five, six days a week. Now, how about the coaches who are there and that are the core of the program? Well, we did that. We did that. All the coaches were UC Berkeley alumni. We did this for a decade. And mm-hmm. they committed to twice a week. It was an hour and a half, twice a week. And it was very tough for them to work in their schedule. These are doctors, lawyers, engineers, et cetera. But they worked in this their schedule because they knew the importance of them being there to give back. So what they did was make sure their kids were on the team, too. That was a hook. They put their kids on the team, too. So they gave them an extra reason to be there. But I, I don't think it's a hard to sell as we think to get people to give two or three hours a week uh, 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 for a reason, for a reason. And we did it because Jason Kidd asked him. It wasn't like Sean asked him. It was Jason Kidd asking him. So we had the extra celebrity hook, too. But I, I think I, we can. I, it, and I, I just don't, I don't think that it's either or. I think it's both. Mm-hmm. But Agreed. I but, you know, having you know, a sport like volleyball that doesn't have nearly the traction as basketball, right, or baseball. Soccer's huge now, but, it, you know, lacrosse is growing, all these things. But, you know, we're, we're I think what Lance is talking about and what I'm kind of focused on is that day-to-day, the, the one who shows up for, you know, every day who needs to be able to, who loves what they're doing, but just can't continue to do it because they can't live. And then you talk about, you know, for us right now, being in California, trying to live in California off of what they're making as a club, you know, a club coach, they're doing okay, but they're still, they still have five roommates, right? And so it, it really is this idea of, of trying to figure out how to create a system where, you know, where we can attract the diverse coaches that we need and they aren't, they aren't sacrificing and, and surviving to do the work that has to be done. And and I think that goes back to a a few of you said this earlier um, that we have to raise the bar for, for expecting a living wage for our, our people to, to support our people. Right. It, It doesn't, I don't need to always be a volunteer. I don't have to always be poor. It's one of the reasons I left teaching. It's like, I, I'm I'm doing what I think is some of the most important work in the world. And I can't afford to live in my home in California. So, you know, I think that that is our, our, our bigger challenge is, is figuring out how to, how to make it sustainable and also how to, to, to make sure that we are, um, that we're supporting our kids at the same time. Right. And I think you also, your, your answer is also embedded in there is um, systems. Mm-hmm. We need, need to create systems that support yeah. this. Um, it can't be on the coach to sacrifice a livelihood yeah. in order to, to give back. And it can't be on the organization to sacrifice like number of roster because we can only support so many kids because we have to pay a living wage. Yeah. And, and there needs to be a system that supports youth sports organizations thriving and youth sport coaches thriving. Um, also, I, I just wanted to mention sometimes that person isn't going to have all the checks. And as an organization, there's a need for investment. Um, bringing in the trainings, having, um, if you bring someone in who just has a ton of passion for kids, 
volleyball is a unique sport. Not everyone is going to have that skill set to coach volleyball, but they are going to be able to tell those girls or those guys like, good job. I'll see you next week. <laughs> and as an organization, not sending that person away, but investing in their education, um, it also creates that that relationship between the coach and the organization because the organization is committed to me. So I'm committed to them. And although I may not be the best uh, at cheer, they uh, the the org knows that I'm I'm going to show up for these these girls or these guys every single week. And as a result. Let's bring in some trainings. Um, we can we can start having conversations about developing positive athletes, and um, we can start having conversations about how there's we have workshops specifically talking about how sports can battle racism, and that really creates that level of um, investment in what they're doing. Sean, you mentioned it when they start to realize the importance of the work that they're doing. That hour and a half commitment can change lives. That changes what that commitment feels like. You're more likely to get and sit in the traffic and get over to the field because you know it's more than just, uh, I don't know, $20 worth of gas. <laughs> There's a life that's going to change on the other side of that traffic. So um, I think all of those investments also build the type of coach that we want to have our youth get, get connected to. Um, and they may not have all of the check marks. They may not have the perfect on the field expertise, but they may have some in the community expertise. Um, a lot of times we we um, downplay the expertise of being someone from a community, and that is that 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 shines for for kids. If they can say, "I grew up down the street. I I know that store. I remember when old man uh, Chris used to give me cheese, or like he used to give me a fago pop when I wasn't looking." Like that changes the connection with those youth, and they're more likely to come to the next practice compared to um, the the coach who just knows all of the plays they may not have the same traction with some of our youth. So like that all makes a difference. Brandon, you came off of mute. So you have something you want to join with me? And I was just going to add, because someone mentioned it earlier and I wanted to expand on it a little bit, but, you know, specifically talking about at the grassroots level, like, you know, you said it and, and someone else said it, like the coach doesn't have to be an expert. He doesn't have to have played professionally and, and, and know every single thing about the sport because in reality, especially at the grassroots level, but in reality, most of the kids that we're working with are never going to play professional. Um, and it's just, it's statistically speaking, that's just the way it is. Um, it's very difficult to reach a professional level. And so, you know, having someone there consistently oftentimes is 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 better than having someone who maybe knows the, the game in and out. Like it, it doesn't, it, at certain levels, it matters. You know, when we're talking about elite level competition, yeah, that it, it starts to, you know, there's there's differences between having certain coaches and, and the knowledge that you're that you're gaining but like from for a majority of the, the goalkeepers that i work with or like the soccer players that i work with um in my area you know a lot of them simply just want me there um and i happen to have experience but like it's it's about having coaches there as opposed to so much you know all that you know that coach has all the knowledge in the world like it's it's just about the consistency and and the, and the ability to show up thank you so I want to thank all of you, um, all of our esteemed panelists, Brandon Miller, Kinshasa Garrett, Dr. Nancy Dome, Lance Lee, and Sean Granberry. The expertise you brought to this dialogue is um, insurmountable. Like I appreciate and thank all of you for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, if you guys each can come off of mute and share with our audience where they can find more information about your work and how they can support the continued efforts of athletes and sport leaders to impact communities for positive change. I'll, I'll jump in and go first. Um, I can be found at drnancydome.com. Uh, the work that I do is specifically around compassionate dialogue and how to engage in difficult conversations, regardless of whether it's um, personal or in your workplace during sports. But this idea of of doing the work that you can, showing up with empathy and understanding and um, being able to resolve difficult things together. So uh, that's a way to find me and you can learn more from my website. And thank you so much. Um, I've enjoyed the conversation very much. And I just wanna pause after Dr. Nancy Dohm because she's too humble, but today her book launched Competitive Dialogue Journey at number one. So I wanna take this moment to acknowledge that, that wonderful thank news. You. And I, I'm going to say it's compassionate dialogue journey, and only because I don't want people to think that I'm talking about competitive dialogue. It's all about <laughs> how do we show up with compassion and with love and empathy for ourselves and for each other. So thank you so much. I appreciate that.
And Shasta, can you share with us how people can learn more about the work that you do? Yes, so my email address is the letter K Garrett, G-A-R-R-E-T-T -E at USASF.net. And you can visit our DEIS landing page that also has some great resources in there as well at USASF.net forward slash DEIS. And I also uh, facilitate leadership training for both athletes and coaches. And as I said earlier, these are this is part of some of the discussion that we have during those times. Thank you, Sean. I think you are off of mute. Okay, uh, Sean Granberry. Um, you can find information at hiphoptv.com. And my email is Sean, S-H-A-W-N at hiphoptv.com. We're going to be posting our camps for the rest of the year. So we've got free camps, technology and sports camps that run in partnership with Oakland Park and Rec, as well as in partnership with PCA that run uh, for the rest of the year here in the Greater Bay Area. And we'll be taking it nationwide uh, starting next year. Um, Lance Lee, uh, Lance.Lee at TeamSnap.com. TeamSnap, one word, dot com. And um, for the entire company, uh, the program I run is called Team Snap Impact. So it's TeamSnap.com. Just click on resources and then you'll see a big logo that says Team Snap Impact. And it talk, you can apply for grants there, uh, direct financial grants. You can apply for the technology grant I spoke about and find out about all the great organizations that we are supporting. Thank you. Brandon, where can we learn more about the work that you're doing in Charlotte? Uh, yeah, you can head to my website, brandonmiller.site. Uh, it has a lot of links to some of the organizations that I work with, some of the work that I've done before, uh, some of the speaking engagements that I've done, and, and some of the work that we're targeting for 2024 and beyond. So um, you can contact me on there, my, you know, my email address, the contact form, or find some of my social media pages through there. But uh, I'm pretty active on all of it, so you can find me pretty much wherever. Thank you to all of our panelists, as well as our attendees. Um, I really appreciate your engagement in this discussion of hope. Um, today's webinar on advancing equity through sport illuminates the powerful vehicle that sport plays in empowering our communities toward change. We've explored the achievements of past sport leaders and elevated the current work happening across the nation. Sports provides a platform to engage and empower others to be change agents in their community. We encourage schools and communities to continue the legacy of social activism in sports and use our discussion to catalyze social change in your neighborhood. Nelson Mandela said, sports has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sports can create hope where once there was only despair. I hope that something from today's webinar resonates with each of you and inspires you to join us in building toward a future filled with sports, youth, and hope. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you have an awesome Thursday and I wish you all happy Black History Month.